unless you allow the court to see it in the way the court recognizes. And that is why you use their own documents to deliver. Now, just to prove to you that we've explained this, maybe not this way, but we have had that there from the get-go. Remember, from the very beginning, we said that you place a private document, being an ecclesiastical deed, on the reverse of a public document, being the summons and the issue or whatever it is. Why? Because they can't see the private without the public. So please be aware there are forms in every jurisdiction that can be used to deliver these documents as full annexed documents attached to an affidavit of evidence or fact or whatever the name is to transport that in. Go and have a look and make sure that that is how you're delivering it. Never simply hand across a raw document without having the mechanism there. Another big one that we've been missing and I hope you don't mind me going through these but I think it's important again that we share these uh, lessons that people are learning how many of us have gone to court particularly at a magistrate's court especially at district courts and viewed the judge as the enemy let's look at it a slightly different way if you're going to go into their courts who is the one person you want to have on site? Well, I'd suggest it be the judge. I'd certainly suggest it be the magistrate. If you are going to pick someone that is going to be your adversary and someone that you can shift the blame to, would it not make sense that that person ultimately should be the usurper? Well, who is the usurper? Isn't the usurper the one who is claiming to be you, the pro se cutis. I don't know whether it be uh, because we've been frustrated. I don't know whether it's because we've come from a position that if we are adversarial and deliberately adversarial, that this is the way to succeed. But for some reason, We've convinced ourselves, even though we know we need to be competent now, and I think that is a general acceptance. Everyone accepts now you need to be competent. But we still haven't got over this issue that the last thing you want to do is upset a judge, be rude to a judge, make the judge your prime target. Far from it. If I was going to court today, the one that I would be looking to show the utmost respect to and the utmost honour to and in no way embarrass is the judge or the magistrate and I would be using all my effort to focus on the prosecutor because the prosecutor has produced a scrivener's error a scrivener's error being the wrong charge the wrong document that the prosecutor has failed to produce the evidence the prosecutor has made the mistakes not the judge if I give the judge a reasonable explanation that this case is unwarranted and if I give examples to the judge or the magistrate that I do truly understand what is going on but I direct the effectiveness and the direction of who to blame to the prosecutor then I would expect more often than not the judge is going to throw it out, knock it on the head and find some happy way out. But if I attack a judge, if I embarrass a judge or a magistrate, then I bet you now that in most cases they're going to dig in and they are going to throw everything at me. So think about this, please. If this is about strategy and battle and tactics, it is... And there's no other way to say it, I'm sorry, but it is stupid, the height of stupidity and incompetence to go to court and start parrying with the judge as your natural enemy. Even if that judge is bombastic, rude, well, that's how they are. Your real target is to load it on the prosecutor because they are the one that are bringing the controversy. Please don't lose sight of that. So 
the one more thing I just want to, to raise, and that is always remember, just as a judge will give multiple opportunities to a competent uh, representation to find some truths, you should also consider the same to a, a judge. If you're going to introduce something that's controversial, that's private, I would say, Your Worship, uh, I'm about to introduce some material that is um, of a sensitive nature that I would prefer to present to you in confidence in chambers rather than in this public forum. Give the judge the opportunity to deal with it in private if you're going to start introducing uh, particular elements. But above all, remember, above all, that honour and respect and not making the judge your enemy is an extremely important point. So I hope these are some key updates. I hope I hope we um, I hope these uh, cover. All right. Now I want to talk about co cognitive law, and uh, I have earphones on tonight. So if I'm if I'm hesitating, it's just it's a little bit different. I normally don't have the headphones on, so it's a bit like having a head cold. But I want to cover some important points on cognitive law to continue this theme of just how powerful we are and how important this material is. And I want to cover a couple of areas that I, I feel are absolutely crucial. We have covered these before, but I want to cover them again in light of, of this material coming very close to being ready to be published. And is the issue of, is this the only life we're going to lead? Do we only really have one mind? What happens when we die? And how powerful is our imagination? Well, one of the things that has come about from the deep research on cognitive law and defining the mind is that when we think of the mind and we think of consciousness, many of the models that we refer to are models produced by the very people that founded things like psychology. For example, uh, Freud. You know, Freud creating the concept of the id, the ego, the superego, a tripartite model of mind. When you think of what we've described in the past in terms of there being three neural networks, your spine, your cerebellum, your cortex, dealing with um, different functions within the body, Rather than being three, there is, in terms of consciousness, four that strike a chord. Now, the word uh, unconscious means not conscious. So it, it is a term that is, unfortunately, an absurdity that doesn't help us but hinders us. So when we look at this, we can better define the structure of our mind in four parts by defining the conscious then an interconnecting relay component of conscious called the interconscious or the cerebellum. Then we have the subconscious being the autonomous functions of the body. And then we have the higher conscious or the superconscious. So instead of there being three parts, think of uh, three circles in a triangle and then one circle that connects them all together. Name one circle the conscious on the outer, another circle the subconscious on the outer, another circle the superconscious, and then in the center, call that the interconscious. Now we have a model that mimics the physical and a model that starts to explain the different levels of mind. So this is some of the exciting insights that are coming through in the cognitive law. Now another thing that we said in, in, in understanding just how powerful we are is that whenever we have a model, whether it be positive law, cognitive law, Eucadia, psychology, whatever it is, 
the power of the mind is that whatever the mind believes, it will manifest to reality. It will manifest as true. Now, as part of the work I've been doing, I have been reading and rereading texts that I studied and, and, and looked at previously, particularly in the area of mind control and some of the horrendous history that is associated, whether it be monarch, whether it be the tests of the Nazis and Mengele, whatever the, whether it be the CIA tests, particularly using LSD. And when you look through those, one of the most incredible insights of mind control is that the strongest mind control concept there is, is the belief that mind control is possible. Let me explain. If you believe that mind control is possible, then you believe that free will can be conquered. And there is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to suggest in the universe that you can sell, depreciate, suspend, knock on the head, free will at any point. Free will is a fundamental element of the system. The system is not some predestined outworking of some historical document. It is an active thing. If Eleanor was heading towards us and we were told, not that I think the authorities would ever tell us, that there is nothing to stop it hitting us, our ability to visualize Eleanor missing the earth is powerful enough to change the course of history. It may not be enough energy, enough visualization to achieve it, but if one can achieve, then all can achieve. If you heard of the hundredth monkey, it's a saying that's been around now for a while. It relates to the fact that they say that once a hundred of a particular species, and using primates as an example, have achieved a level of conscious awareness that a monkey learning a particular technique in Madagascar means that monkeys in Uganda will start using the same technique. The power of visualization of one is enough to change. Imagine what it is when you've got several hundred, even a several thousand visualizing the world that we want to live in. So mind control an existing system depends on our belief that what they're telling us is true. Now, I'll give you an example of, of this again, and it's, it's, I know it's veering a bit from cognitive law, but I think it, it is relevant and from my personal experience. My personal experience with finance and having spent time and worked in politics is that there is a huge gap between the claim and the reality. The claim by banks and the claim by insurance companies is that they are technical experts, that they have the latest and greatest back office systems, that they are fully on top of everything they're doing. <laughs> Let me tell you why that is complete rubbish. I did some work for two of the largest banks in Australia years and years and years ago. And when I got in there, as I had seen in insurance, they had spent hundreds of millions of dollars on computer systems. And they had phenomenal amounts of data. Not knowledge, just data. Just huge volumes of data. But the one computer program that ran the whole company after spending hundreds and hundreds of millions. In fact, this computer program was so important that if it failed, the whole company, the whole bank would fail. You know what that program was? Excel. Microsoft Excel. Banks, insurance companies, corporations around the world, for all the money they've spent, at the end of the day, it is some high-level men and women 
sitting on pace, say he's topping X 